one thing that I've been really impressed with in following you, Lane, is the, uh, what's the right word I wanna use? Um, the, the deliberate nature with which you approach things. So I've seen pictures of you where I think like he doesn't even look like a human being, he's so ripped and shredded. And I've seen pictures of you where you look kind of chubby and you've been very clear and said, I'm going through different phases. I'm very deliberate about what I do. This is a phase where I am adding a ton of lean mass and with it comes some body fat. And right now I'm taking it off. But um, one, you're very deliberate, so nothing's haphazard. And two, you really emphasize the importance of consistency. So how do I stay consistent? Because it's it doesn't take nearly as much work to preserve muscle mass once you have it, but you, and I talked about this with Alex Hutchinson on a previous podcast, one of the things I fear the most for my patients as they age is any sort of injury or illness that takes them out of exercise. Because the deconditioning that occurs when someone doesn't do anything for a month is devastating. So can you, can you put some numbers to that? Because I, I believe you've spoken about this, which is what is the effort required to maintain uh, and I'm not talking about show, you know, like 4% body fat on a stage. I'm talking about, and again, we'll use your numbers as an example. You happen to be, you know, great to begin with, but you know, for you to stay at 13, 14% body fat um, is not the end of the world. It's not a huge sacrifice, but it requires being diligent still. What does that mean to you? And how do you advise your clients around that? So there's a few layers to this. Um, when it comes to resistance training, I mean, this is really just anything in life. Resistance training taught me so much about just life overall, right? So the same people who come up with biohacks of how you can like get to your goal in 12 weeks or whatever, in the financial world, they're the same people who are like, hey, join my pyramid scheme and earn six figures from home doing one hour of work a week. Most reasonable people know that that's not how you acquire wealth, right? You acquire wealth through, if, if you're, you know, Thomas J. Stanley's, I use fiscal examples because I just find it's easier for people. Um, but 80% of millionaires are first generation self-made. Um, and most of them got there not through getting lucky, but the fact that they saved more money than they earned, they were consistent, and they did that for a long period of time. Now that is the granular mechanistic way of doing it, kind of like how we talk about calories in, calories out, right? But what it takes to get that consistency is modification to behavior, right? Because for the same reason that somebody binges on whatever, donuts, chocolate, cakes, cookies, whatever, uh, is the same reason that somebody who also knows, hey, in order for me to save money, I need to earn more than I spend, still goes out and blows 1500 bucks on a shopping spree after a stressful week, right? because they have a habit and an association with something. And so I think people need to understand that consistency is the most important thing. But to create that consistency, you have to change your habits. Um, you have to create habits. I read a, a, a review, systematic review by a, a gal named Marie Spreckley. And I'm gonna give myself a pat in the back here for a second because she actually said, that she went back to school after reading my book, Fat Loss Forever, and it's what inspired her to do her PhD work, which is pretty awesome. Um, and she did a systematic review of looking at people who lost weight and kept it off. So some of the commonalities of that. And a lot of it was what you expected. Consistency, um, ability to embrace challenges rather than, um, rather than running from them or viewing challenges as part of the process. I think a lot of people, when setbacks occur or challenges occur, they feel that that's abnormal as opposed to embracing it as part of this process. But then something that was in the paper that I hadn't thought about before that I think is so critical to developing that consistency and making a change, forming a new identity. So the people who lost weight and kept it off said that they had to form a new identity. And I really chewed on this for a while. And, and, and do you know Ethan Suplee? No, but I was, I was just about to say, James Clear is the first person who made that point clear to me, no pun intended. And it, it, of all the things in James's book, 
that one actually appealed to me the most, which was it's not about dis. Well, I always knew it wasn't about discipline and willpower because those things are going to fade over time. But this piece around, and let's use exercise as the example, it's going from, oh, I have to do this thing, I have to do this thing, to I'm a person who exercises, I'm a fit person. That's the transition that makes it easier to do day in and day out. And that's probably why I've never struggled with exercise. I struggle with the opposite. I really struggle to take a day off. I think to be completely transparent, I'm always gonna struggle with food a little bit. I haven't had the full identity switch in food, but I, was, I think I was born with, or at least it was etched in my brain when I was so young due to my insecurities around exercise. So I think you said something very poignant there, and that's you just put in your mind, this is what I do. This is what I do. This is part of who I am. And so Ethan Suplee, he's an actor, um, and he was in, you probably, if you've seen the movie, Remember the Titans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, yes, yes, yes. I know I know who you're talking about now. He lost a staggering amount of weight, like a, almost an unrecognizable yeah, amount of weight. He's Jack now, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I talk to him pretty frequently. And uh, he has a thing he puts on his Instagram. He, he, he say, I killed my clone today. And I asked him about that because I read Marie's paper and then I made this connection because I always wondered what he meant by I killed my clone today. And I said, is this what you mean? That you formed a new identity, that, that you killed the old person that you were. And mm. he said, that is exactly what I mean. Because you cannot create a new life, a new identity, or you cannot create a new life and you cannot have a physical and overall change in your life without fund while still dragging those behaviors behind you, right? Let's, t let's take a basic example, an alcoholic, right? If you decide, if an alcoholic decides tomorrow, I don't want to be this anymore. You have to change everything. You can't just, okay, I want to stop drinking. No, no, your entire identity has been around, I go to a bar, I hang out with my friends after work, they probably drink, my family probably drank growing up, that's where I learned it from. Now you've got to change everything. You are not going to be able to be, you know, this new person while still dragging your old behaviors behind you. And I think a lot of people try to do that when it comes to nutrition and maybe even exercise. It's, it's well, I, I want things to change, but I don't want to give up my, you know, three glasses of wine a night, or I don't want to give up this, or I don't want to give up that. What I always tell people is like, listen, the great thing about nutrition is you get to pick what you sacrifice, okay? So for me, what made it easy for me and I always tell people, you should pick the form of restriction that feel, feels easiest to you. I don't care what anybody else feels like. For me, if I'm able to eat whatever foods I want, as long as I control portion size and track my calories and macros and whatnot, that feels easy. That is not difficult for me to maintain like a lean physique and, and athletic. Um, but for other people, that may be extremely tedious, difficult, it may feel labor intensive. To me, it doesn't. What feels labor intensive to me is saying, okay, Lane, you can't have, you know, processed food ever again, or you can't have carbs, or you can't have fats or whatever. But for other people, some people, I hear it all the time, say, I did X diet, ketogenic diet, and it felt easy. I did intermittent fasting. I was never hungry. It felt easy. Cool. Great, just don't assume that what was easy for you is gonna be easy for everybody else because this, you know, I thought flexible dieting was gonna be the solution for everybody because it was easy for me. So I arrogantly assumed that it'd be that way for everybody else. And I think everybody goes through that, that sort of like, you know, you seek out your own echo chamber sort of thing, right? And you find these people who had the same, that had the same experience as you and you just assume everybody's like that. It turns out, no, no, people are quite different. So find the, the, you get to pick the type of restriction. Find what feels easiest. And try not to get too caught up in, well, this diet increases fat oxidation and insulin and like all these little things we talk about. Because at the end of the day, if you've ever lost weight and then regained it, why did it happen? It didn't happen because you didn't get your macronutrient ratio perfect or your nutrient timing wasn't down. It happened because you stopped being consistent with the behaviors that you implemented. That's what happened. And the same thing goes with exercise. People tell me all the time, like, man, Lane, 
I wish I was motivated like you. I'm like, ha! <laughs> uh, I, I, I would say that I, I love lifting weights and that makes it easier to be motivated. I acquired that love through years. Um, but I don't always love it. Just like I'm not always happy with my spouse, right? Like some days we fight. Doesn't mean I don't love her overall. It just means some days we get annoyed at each other. Some days I'm unhappy with weightlifting. I don't want to do it. However, I always tell people, and I'm not saying you can never take a day off, of course. You know, if you need a day off to reset, whatever, that's fine. You just got to be careful that that doesn't turn into weeks and months and years, right? And here's the comparison I use. I don't have to be motivated to go into train. It's part of what I do. Just like I don't have to be motivated and pump myself up to brush my teeth. Do you know why? Because it's a very simple equation. If I don't brush my teeth, they're going to go to crap. Just like if I don't exercise, my body's going to go to crap. So it doesn't, it is not for me, it is not a question of motivation. It is a question of what do I want and what are the actions that are required to get what I want. And if my actions do not line up with what is needed and the amount of work that is needed, it's very simple. I'm not going to get what I want. And it's on a fundamental level, it's that simple. But getting people to one, buy in, and two, you know, get past the stage where you start and you've got that honeymoon phase and everything feels good. You're like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And then you hit your first challenge or your first setback or you, your scale fluctuates. Actually, during the, the, the systematic review, uh, participants talked about how um, seeing the scale fluctuate what was, was a difficult thing to get over. And some people would quit because they would gain three pounds when in reality they probably just had a, a bad weigh-in day. That's why This is why I actually tell people weigh in every single day and take the average because the average is not going to fluctuate that much. Um, so anyways. No, I, I, think, I think those are just, those are, those are great points. Yeah. The point of this all is that consistency is the fundamental, you can do, you could have any diet, you could have any training system. If you're consistent, you're going to see results. I, I use this comparison and I'll, I'll throw it back to you on this one. If I said to you, Peter, I want you to go out and become the best three point shooter you possibly can be. You cannot get any instruction. You can't read any books. You can't uh, get a, a coach, nothing. But if all you did every single day for three hours a day for 10 years was go out and shoot three pointers, you probably wouldn't be in the NBA, but I bet you'd be pretty damn good at shooting three pointers. You know what I mean? I, I would agree with that. Hopefully better than I am now. Because right now, I'm not <laughs> joking, my 12 year old daughter is probably the same as me at shooting three pointers, which means by the time she's 13, she might be better than me. <laughs> well, I think that's the, that's the other thing for people to keep in mind is use other people's stories for inspiration, but be very careful about comparing yourself because what you need to ask yourself is, can I get better? Try not to ask yourself, can I be like X person? Because the answer might be no, but here's the rub. You'll never know unless you put in the, the decade worth of work, right? Like when I started out, I had people tell me, why are you lifting weights? You're skinny. You'll never be, you'll never be jacked. And then even when I got into powerlifting, people were like, look at how long your legs are. <laughs> look at how you squat. You will never be good at this. If I would have listened to that, I never would have set a gold medal in the squat. I never, I never would have done that. Now, that world record got broken and I may never get it back. Very good chance I'll never get it back. But I got a lot farther than I ever could have imagined just through sheer consistency. I did a lot of stuff wrong, but sheer mass effect of work and consistency can make up for a lot of shortcomings. And I think a lot of people out there have paralysis by analysis and they never just start because they're so intimidated by all the information that's out there. 
This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.